you have to be resilient to be able to cope in any environment. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The only thing I was scared of was failing, was letting down the people there that I was supposed to support. Things went south really bad. You've got to have an element of crazy to be good at what we do. There was an ego attached to being a gun fighter. Being around big tall trees, thick shrubbery, potentially connects him to other moments in his life during battle. It's not easy to steal. You walk in the mine field, not knowing when your legs are going to get blown off. You know we're a part of this fight. The story of transformation is powerful. Welcome to Life on the Line. Today's conversation is between Sharon Maskell-Dare and the current commander of Joint Task Force 633, Major General Susan Coyle, CSC, DSM. JTF 633 is the headquarters under which all Australian military operations in the Middle East are conducted. As commander, Susan has oversight for 1,200 personnel at time of recording. Sharon recorded her part from her home in Adelaide, while Susan was recorded locally in the Joint Task Force 633 headquarters in the Middle East. They spoke about Susan's military career so far and their current mission in the Middle East. I'm Sharon Maskeldare and you're listening to Life on the Line. In this week's episode, we meet a distinguished army officer who's currently serving on operations in the Middle East. Major General Susan Coyle, CSC, DSM, is well-respected and well-known throughout the Australian Army, and she joins us from Joint Task Force 633 in the Middle East, where she assumed command in January this year. Major General Coyle, thank you very much for joining us on Life on the Line. Good morning, Sharon. Thank you for having me. So tell us about how you came to be interested in the military, given your long and distinguished career. Did you come from a military family? Well, I actually have both my grandfathers, um, neither of whom um, I was uh, fortunate enough to know because they passed away before I was born, but they served in World War II. One was in the Navy and one was in the Air Force. But I actually decided on a military career because of my older sister, Alice. She was in school cadets at Mudgee Cadet Unit. She was four years older than me. And so therefore I joined Mudgee Cadet Unit. And then when we moved to Tamworth many years ago, my father worked on the Water Resources Commission and we lived in a small town called Manila. She went to school in Tamworth and she joined the Army cadet unit there, 1216 Hunter River Lancers. So naturally, four years later, I joined 1216 Hunter River Lancers. And then uh, she joined the regular army and uh, I applied for a scholarship and I joined uh, at ADFA in 1989. So I'm just following her footsteps. So when you were growing up, if I could um, ask a little bit more about that, I mean, what were your perceptions then of the military? You know, what did you imagine it was going to be like before you actually joined up yourself? Truthfully, I don't think I had any idea. We lived on dam sites all of our life growing up and we moved a lot and I didn't really know anybody that was in the military. My father, when we lived in Manila, had a friend that he used to go to the bowling club every night and have a beer with, who was a Changi prisoner of war returnee, and uh, I got to know him a little bit. But uh, other than that, I really didn't have much knowledge or awareness at all. I just, I don't know, in my heart, I just knew it was something that I wanted to do. And you mentioned the fact you went to ADFA, where you study for a Bachelor of Science. So, so why science? Why did you go down that route? <laughs> I actually think this is quite funny because I, I went to ADFA on a scholarship, a leadership scholarship, and I started doing an art arts degree and at the end of my first year I was studying geography and military history and apparently my geography subjects were science related and the academy turned me into a science degree student so I don't really see myself as a scientist. I was a hard worker, I was more studious than I think I was academic and these were the days where it was pre-laptops and smartphones. I spent a lot of time at the library. I can imagine what that would have been like because I've been into the library at ADFA and it's quite an inspiring place actually, isn't it? I mean, there's there's some decent amount of books there. Definitely. But uh, I love studying. I still do love studying. But uh, yeah, no, I'm not really a scientist. uh, If you use the term that I'm sure all my maths and physics friends would be uh, looking at me saying she is not a scientist. You ended up then joining the Royal Australian Corps of Signals. So why Signals? Well, again, you know, my sister Alice, who I joined the army to follow, she went to Signals Corps as well. 
Being at 1216 Hunter River Lancers, I really liked the Armoured Corps environment. If I could have gone Armoured Corps out of the Royal Military College at the time, I think I would have asked to. But I was really, really uh, happy to get selected to go to Signals. And as it turned out, I did both my Troop Command and my OC time in 104 Signal Squadron, which was the Signal Squadron as part of the Mech Brigade, the 1st Brigade. So I spent my Lieutenant time in Holsworthy when the 1st Brigade was still in Sydney, and my OC time up in Darwin. I guess I got the best of both worlds. I think, though, looking back, I mean, I know that you were born in the same year that I was. And if I think back to the fact that there were no smartphones, I mean, my experience with computers was non-existent until I went to university. You've seen a lot of technological change in that area of signals. So what's that been like for you? Uh, Look, it's been a wonderful journey. You know, when I think back to when I joined the army, we were really an analogue army. And to think that that not only the Corps, but the Australian Defence Force is heading down the path where it's going to be completely fifth generation. I mean, that's pretty amazing. And I was really honoured for the last two and a half years before coming into this job. I was also dual hatted as head of Corps for the Royal Australian Corps of Signals. And, uh, you know, that's just a huge honour. And have no doubt our men and women inside Signals Corps are just some of the best in the world. They are the brightest, smartest people. And they take this technology and they run with it because it's the people that enable change. The technology is just the contributor to it but put them together you've got a really really amazing product. Now fondly within the Australian Army they're sometimes called geeks so have you ever seen yourself as a geek do I ask? (laughs) Um, As my pseudoscientist no I don't you know I learned very early on that geeks are really they're a trade I don't know if you realize that one of our trades in in our corps are called geeks our soldiers are incredibly bright and talented but they're just one of five trades I tried to learn and understand as much as I could from our soldiers we invest in them and we, you know, we spend a lot of money and time getting them to the absolute level for their technical specialisations. These days, I'd say more officers are technically oriented, you know, maybe geek-like than they were when, when I was younger. We had a mixture when I grew up as a young officer. And these days, the, you know, the new buzzword is to get in, into the cyber world, I think, as well. In fact, you mentioned the shift that's undertaken now in signals with regard to cyber security and getting into cyber. Can you tell us a bit more about that? It's a growing area. Like like the rest of the corporate world as well as the military, we're investing heavily. We've created a trade, a defensive cyber operations trade, and we're starting to man and train to that trade now. I mean, I think, you know, it's one of the other domains that we will fight in as we go forward or compete in, and it's something that we have to be specialists at. And uh, I have no doubt some of the uh, young men and women that I've met who've been doing the cyber training or who are working in that area, they are absolutely up to the task. Now, in the course of your career, you've had a number of significant deployments. Could you perhaps take us back to your first deployment, which was to Timor-Leste? What were you expecting before you went on that deployment? It's a very fond time for me to think back to the first time I had the honour of going on operations. I'd actually, if you go back just a little bit of time before I deployed there, because I deployed there as the J6, the head of the communications team in 2002, but back in 1999, I was aide de camp to Commander Australian Theatre. That was during the lead up to go into East Timor as it was then. And I travelled with Major General Connolly, who was the commander at the time. So we went in in 1999 at the same time, you know, in that first week. And so I had a little bit of a glimpse of what had happened and why we went in there. And I also had the opportunity on several occasions to travel with him to Opelisi, which is in Bougainville. So I'd had a little bit of a glimpse into the deployments or what I could expect before I actually deployed in 2002 as the J6. These days, young soldiers and young officers get to deploy quite early in their careers. But for me, my first real deployment was as a major. We just wanted to support the mission. And uh, I found working with the United Nations to be a really interesting and challenging time. I, uh, I had no experience with them. Lots of nations on the ground. You know, I wasn't embedded into the headquarters of the peacekeeping force. I was actually part of the Australian National Command element. But, you know, I look back with absolute fond memories. I don't think you can ever really understand what you're going into until you get there. And then you just take every day in your stride. For our listeners to perhaps understand a bit more about that experience, what was it like being immersed in a conflict zone and carrying such a level of responsibility. I mean, you talk about being in the J6 role, which is responsible for communications. I mean, that's a significant role within that context, isn't it? Every job on a mission is equally important. You know, everyone has a role to play. It's like a big jigsaw puzzle. No piece is any more important than any other piece. But to be able to communicate, especially in an environment where it's not safe and things could be happening and the commander has to have that situational awareness at all levels. So, yeah, there was a lot of responsibility. And how did you deal with being in in that insecure environment to some extent? I mean, it's one thing, you know, for people listening to this program to be able to imagine what it's like to go on deployment. But when it's your first time, 
I mean, what's the reality in terms of the way you have to draw on your training, on your resilience to be able to function at your absolute best? Everyone draws on the people around them. I mean, the people that I worked with in the communications team in particular are some of my closest friends these days. We've stayed in contact over the years. I think you draw together through adversity and resilience does make you stronger. You have to be resilient to be able to cope in any environment. And, you know, our people are trained very well. We do a lot of exercises back in Australia. We do mission support training or mission rehearsal exercises before we go anywhere or do anything. And plus, there's a lot of people in theatre that can draw on. I mean, my commander, when I was over there as the J6, the commander of the Australian contingent, he was a artillery colonel, Jared Fogarty. You could go and ask him anything. You could ask for advice or bounce any idea off him. And, you know, you were never alone. It's not like you had to do anything alone. You were always part of a bigger team. And when you first got there, what were your first impressions? Can you perhaps fill us in as to what the political situation was on the ground and, and what the realities were that you and the rest of the task group were facing? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I was a couple of years into the mission by the time I arrived for my role. So, you know, on the surface, I think it looks a lot safer and you're not seeing all the, the buildings on fire and things of that nature that we saw in 1999 or people, you know, really panicking and trying to seek asylum and, and get away. But, I mean, there were times while I was there in my tour where there was significant uncertainty, where there were riots through town or people with weapons firing, you know, what appeared to be willy-nilly, but I'm sure it wasn't. There were still displaced people, you know, you would drive around the country and there would be people, you know, living under UNHCR tentage in the middle of nowhere because they'd been displaced from their village who were just completely reliant upon NGOs and the UN peacekeepers to try and help them and to get them back to a state where they could go home to their villages. And there were a lot of people in need as well. We did a fair amount of work, as did the rotations before and after mine, with some local orphanages. And also uh, we used to have Sundays off and on our Sundays we would also uh, go and teach English up at the local Catholic church or the Catholic school, which uh, looking back, just an amazing experience. Amazing people, beautiful country, a lot of pride in their country. And they really genuinely appreciated us being there. So looking back on that deployment now, what's perhaps always stayed in your mind as being one of the highlights that stayed with you? Probably two separate things. The first is that I really love having a team over there together. We're a pretty tight team. There was only ever six or seven of us in the comms group and we really formed a good bond and have stayed in contact. But the other part that I really, you know, in addition to the privilege of providing the communications was actually the, the stuff that we did in our own time on our Sundays. Our support to the orphanages, whether it be going and helping them to fix a roof or taking the kids down to the beach and having a swim or teaching English. I didn't teach English for very long. When one of the students asked me what a split infinitive was, I thought, my goodness, their English is probably better than mine. I just look back and it's the people that I have the most fond regard for. And, and when I think back to the task we did and we did well, I was very proud of them. But yeah, it was the people that I worked with or I came into contact with that have been the real differentiator for me. Now, your next deployment was to the Solomon Islands. That would have been obviously a very different situation. Perhaps could you refresh our memories as to what the complexities were geopolitically that you were dealing with on arrival there? Very different, again, to what was occurring in East Timor, now Timor-Leste. But we were part of um, Ramsey. I used to laugh and call it recruit another major to the Solomon Islands because when I got there, there just seemed to be so many people there, so many officers working. But we were working alongside the AFP and it was to really try and get the government functional again. It was a different environment for me, though. Like when I went to Timor and you would see the people in need when you were in the Solomon Islands that was less obvious to the naked eye because of their Wontok system that they had there they were very very close as families and groups and I just didn't see the orphanages and things of that nature that I think in my mind I'd been expecting from my time in Timor but uh, you know to work alongside whole of government with other agencies like the AFP and state police you know that was a really really unique time for me Again, my role over there was the J6 to provide the communications. So I wasn't actually involved in any of the political discussions or any of that nature, but I would attend the back briefs and hear about what was going on. But just, yeah, very professional people doing what they can to provide security and stability into the region that is the Solomon Islands. Were there any key moments then from that particular experience that have stayed with you? Oh, look, I think uh, just, you know, the honour of commanding on operations again for me, having 104 Signal Squadron there with us. We'd been training during the year and preparing some 
of our team to go to Iraq. And then when this opportunity came up for us to prepare and go to the Solomon Islands, it was just a great opportunity for us to do what we'd trained for and to go as a team. You know, when I went to East Timor, we were all individual rotations and we came from various units. But in the Solomon Islands, the men and women that I worked alongside were all from 104 Signal Squadron and they were just motivated young people to try and make sure that everybody could communicate there. You know, working, as I said before, working alongside the AFP and the State Police was really, really unique for us and just the chance to uh, to make sure that what we did enabled them to do their job. That's what it's really about. Now, your next overseas deployment was to Afghanistan. And obviously, in the series of Life on the Line, previous series, we've met many veterans who've had experience of serving overseas and operations in Afghanistan. When were you there? And perhaps could you recap for us what the situation was that you were walking into over there? I'd had a very brief trip to Afghanistan in 2008. I was going over to be the commanding officer for our Force Communication Unit 3 rotation and had a chance at that stage on the recon to go down to Kandahar and Tarankot and stuff. So I saw what was the the previous component of Operation Slipper in its full form when we had 1,500 men and women serving in that location, heavily engaged in the war fighting component. I unfortunately didn't do that tour. I got sick while I was over there and I didn't go back until 2014 where I went over as the assistant commander of Afghanistan. I was based in Kabul. We had a headquarters there. I worked to the position I'm now in, ironically, the uh, Joint Task Force 633 commander. And it was still in the Operation Slipper days, but we were coming to the end of it. So for my year over there, I spent six months as part of Operation Slipper. And then in the last six months, we had transitioned to the Train Advisor SIS mission, which we're doing today, which is Operation High Road. And what was the reality on the ground in terms of the risks that you were exposed to? I mean, I understand you'd been in a headquarters, but still, what was that sense you had of what you were dealing with? It was still very dangerous. Whilst we didn't have people out in forward operating bases and going outside the wire, and in that sense, we had people going forward to, like, for example, down at Kandahar, we had mentors as part of the 205 Coalition Advisory Team, and they were going out to Camp Hero, where our Afghan partners were, and they were doing that train advice assist and mentoring there. It was still dangerous and I think that Iraq had started up again so some of the capabilities, some of the intelligence surveillance reconnaissance capabilities that we'd come to expect had been redirected. Things appeared to be transitioning closer to the Kabul cluster so where most of the organisations and elements were starting to draw into Kabul. So you know it was a different environment and I think that you think that nothing was going to happen and then things would happen and I'll give you one example. Um, it was only a, a few weeks after I arrived. We have mentors, advisors and a force protection element out at our Afghan National Army Officer Academy at Karga. In August 2014, one of the senior US Army generals, Major General Harry Green, was showing people around and showing the facilities that were out at Karga and unfortunately uh, was killed during a green on blue or a green on green activity that occurred on that camp at that time. And our men and women were part of the response in terms of supporting what happened after that. And it just made me realise that you think you're safe, but you know you're not safe. It's still not a safe environment there now. We're still working closely with the Afghans to try and get them greater peace and security in that location. But things like passing of Major General Harry Green still you know, has an indelible footprint on my heart, realising that anybody is at risk on any day. And I suppose it's also a reminder that it's regardless of rank, because he was clearly very senior. Absolutely. There were a number of ramp ceremonies during the year that I was over there. One of my saddest moments was almost toward the end of my tour, where we lost one of our soldiers. He didn't die in combat on operations. He had an accident whilst on leave. He was in Europe. This was in June 2015. His name was Private Alex Turner. He was a young force protection guardian angel who was based out at Kaga at the time. What it really refined to me was that, you know, we train to go to war and we know that we may lose somebody. We know that, you know, we all have that understanding. But to lose somebody on leave, we just weren't prepared for that. It wasn't expected. And those young men and women that were uh, Alex's mates, you know, most of them had never even lost a grandparent. And they really grieved and they, uh, they were such an incredible young bunch of men and women. They were very close to Alex. He was, from all accounts, from what I've been told, a very popular young soldier. You know, his parents lost their only child and going through that process with them to help them to get over their grief and to prepare to remain focused on the mission but prepare to go home, it can be difficult. I can only understand how difficult it is for anybody to lose anyone, but in these circumstances it was uh, equally tragic. You mentioned as well the importance of that mateship. I mean, given what you've just described there, how tangible was that for you? 
when you did lose people on operations? People are so proud to serve their nation. You know, they volunteer to serve their nation and they go on these operations or training or any other event knowing that, that something may occur. There was an incident in early January of 2015. It was the day before the Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop, came to visit us and uh, it was just adjacent to our headquarters in Kabul. And we had a, a truck, an IED, explode on the perimeter of our base. And it was really, really destructive. Somewhere between 800 and 1,000 kilogram bomb that went off. And parts of that truck found their way all over our camp and some of the windows were blown out and it was really ferocious. I awoke, it was about 5am on a Sunday and I remember waking up thinking that the roof of my building had been ripped off. It was just that loud and reverberated the building so much. Thankfully it was 5am on a Sunday and the Sundays are where we used to have a later start in the morning. And so normally on any other given day of the week there would have been people out running and what have you. And that's the only reason that we didn't have coalition casualties that day. And the next day when uh, the foreign minister came to visit, she just took it in a stride. It was really quite remarkable. I mean, there was devastation everywhere. There was cables hanging out of roofs and windows smashed and broken and the defect where the engine of the truck had gone through the roof was getting repaired and that. And she just took it in a stride and walked around and spoke to the men and women of our task force. And, you know, I just thought, wow, this is an amazing, amazing moment in history to be a part of. I was really honoured to be there and I was just eternally grateful that we didn't have casualties. I think what's remarkable when you describe that is there's the enormity, the reality of, of what people are exposed to when something like that takes place. But then there's also the fact that people somehow dig deep and get back to work. What is it, do you think, that people are able to tap into that enables them to do that? Because I think for people outside of the military, it, it's something which they find quite incredible and, and indeed quite inspiring in some ways. I don't know what that magic formula is. I think it's our training. We go through a pretty significant selection process to join the Australian Defence Force and then we invest significantly in their education and training. You know, people operate as parts of teams from the get-go and we all lean on each other and support. There's a fair amount of training before you deploy into theatre as well and a lot of cultural awareness and things of that nature. So I think we're well prepared when we get there. Who knows how somebody responds though and who knows the impact that that event will have on somebody later on in time. We also offer crisis management following any incident to try and help people get support if they need to talk about it or, you know, have had concerns with what they've seen or been engaged in. You know, it's a pretty robust system, I think, that we have to try and support our people. Now, as part of your career, you've spent considerable periods of time in the United States. Can you tell us a bit more about the work you've completed over there and what that's brought to your military experience? Can I just say that when you join the army, you definitely get to see the world. And I've, uh, I've been really lucky to see lots of the world. Going back, this is going to have a theme with my science degree. So I applied to do a satellite training course, like a satellite engineering course at the School of Signals in Fort Gordon in Augusta, Georgia. And the prerequisite to do that course was that you had to have a science degree. Now, isn't that ironic? I can tell you that when I got there, though, doing link engineering after coming out of a geography and military history background was quite challenging for me. But I got there, I learnt it, and it probably reinforced to me that, you know, if you apply yourself, you can learn anything. It was a great opportunity to do that training. I could change the power level on a transponder above Earth on a military satellite dish at the end of that course. Very useful, of course, back home. But after I did that training, I was posted to the 11th Signal Brigade, which is a US Army brigade, which was then headquartered over in Fort Huachuca in Arizona, Sierra Vista, Arizona, as their brigade satellite engineer. What a great opportunity and experience. It really was. It was remarkable to hang around like-minded people from the United States Army. Thoroughly enjoyed that posting. And my subsequent posting to the United States was actually as a student back in 2016-17 where I attended the United States Army War College. Again, just a phenomenal course, a great program, great professors, 400 students, 74 nations around the world contributed. And I was the Australian student that year, or the International Fellow as we call them. As you know, the US are a key ally of ours and the training that I've done with them over the years has been phenomenal. And wherever I go, there's somebody that I uh, generally will run into that's either from War College or from my previous time at uh, 11 Sig that will reach out and say hello. It's really helped me, I think. It's just broadened me to another military and just wonderful memories again. And today, as we're conducting our, our interview today, I mean, you're over there in the Middle East, we're talking down the line, and you're the commander of Joint Task Force 633. So tell us a bit more about your role there and how that differs perhaps from some of those previous command positions that you've held. 
every job you have, the experiences that you learn, you know, the mistakes that you make, the people that you meet, the opportunities that you're afforded are what make you a better person. And so, you know, when I sit in this seat here and I look back, having had that year in Afghanistan has genuinely really helped me to be able to come into this job in a much easier manner than it would have if I'd, say, never served in the Middle East at all. There is a lot of responsibility in the role as the national commander for our forces in the Middle East. And there are people doing great work all across the theatre. You know, we've got HMAS Toowoomba at the moment in the Arabian Gulf doing maritime security as part of the international maritime security construct. We have aircraft flying on missions above Iraq and Afghanistan every day, whether it be the air-to-air -air refuelers above Iraq or the airborne early warning aircraft providing situational awareness for Operation Okra above Iraq or our C-130s doing air mobility between Afghanistan and our location and other locations. You know, I think there's people doing good work everywhere. Plus, we've got embedded staff in our coalition headquarters in both Iraq and Afghanistan doing great work. And there's all the enablers that go to support that too, whether it be the communications, the logistics, the air base operations, the intelligence, or the headquarters that is surrounding where I am now. Everybody works together to support the mission. And the mission is to provide that security and stability in the region, to defeat Daesh and to make sure that we create an environment where terrorists can't stay here and create an environment where they can impact on us back home. So I think it's, you know, it's a remarkable role to be the commander here, but I'm not here doing this on my own. I am part of a very large, very capable, competent team, and it's together that we're doing what we're doing over here. This next question I know might be a little awkward for you, but you do have a conspicuous service cross and a distinguished service medal. Could you tell us a bit more about those two honours and how you came to receive them? They are great honours. Can I just say that? You don't know who writes you up for an honour or an award. Generally, you'll just find out a couple of years later after the event. My conspicuous service cross was when I was commanding officer of 17 Signal Regiment, a great unit, a really, really good unit. And that unit had a really busy couple of years when I was there in particular. Not only did it have forces deployed to the Middle East and to East Timor providing communications, but it was still providing signal support to its, uh, its parent brigade, which was 17 Brigade, now called 17 Sustainment Brigade, who does log logistics logistics and health. But for me, that award was reflective of everyone in that unit. Not only did we do our support to the Middle East and East Timor and our normal exercises, but there was one particular event, which is what I'm believing that uh, the award came from, but it was a fundraiser that we did to help support a gentleman by the name of Corporal Darren Gibson. I don't know if you know Darren's story, but Darren and I served together in 104 Signal Squadron in Darwin, and we deployed to the Solomon Islands together. A remarkable gentleman who unfortunately lost his family in the King Lake Black Saturday bush fires in March 2010. I lost his wife and three young children and the unit rallied and supported Darren to get back on his feet. He was put into a hospital in Sydney where we were located and for many months we did fundraising and uh, and helped him get back on and I think it was the combination of all of the things that uh, our unit did for those couple of years which resulted in that CSC so it's not just for me it was for the whole team. I remember actually visiting Victoria in the aftermath of those fires and it was shocking and, and devastating just the impact on the community and, and so many families yeah you yeah, know it was just it's just horrendous but we've stayed in contact with Darren and uh, he now lives in Parks. He's just a great guy. We used to bring him out to do some mentoring and that for junior leader development uh, when I was at 17 SIG. But you talk about resilience, the resilience of somebody like Darren to continue on, pick himself up, absolutely inspiring. And if I may, I'd also like to ask you a little bit about your family. We've not spoken about your family yet because I know that you're a mother of three adult children. And as a mother myself, I can appreciate that it's been a team effort to some extent. And I'm keen to find out more about that from your perspective. So I'm actually, I've got a blended family. So I've got a daughter, Jessica, who's 23, and a son, Jack, who's 19. And I've also got a daughter, Susie, who's 23, who's from my husband, Mark's first marriage. So we're, uh, we're a unique little uh, family together. My husband, Mark, is also in the army. He's an engineer. He's currently on operations as well, ironically. He's the Australian contingent commander as part of our United Nations mission in South Sudan. But uh, our three kids are, are just remarkable. So we've been a blended family since the girls were 12. So it's been a while now. You know, sadly, none of them are going to join the military, but they're really strong, capable young adults who are super proud of their parents. And, uh, you know, we're just super proud of them to be able to lift up and move every time we do or just test and adjust when we take off overseas and be there to 
to support us, knowing that we can't be there to support them. So Jess works in admin now. Susie's just about to finish her degree. She's studying at the University of Canberra to do exercise physiology and rehab. And Jack, our baby, a nearly six foot three baby, is uh, just finishing year 12 this year. So they're amazing kids. I still try to get them to join the army, but I don't think I'm gonna have any success at the moment. They don't dislike the army, they just don't wanna join the army. I think they feel like they're in the army already and have been for their entire lives. From how you've described your career, your children would have been very much part of those various communities that you and your husband have been part of over the years. When I was ADC to Commerce, Jessie was only a uh, tiny, she was a couple of years old and I would uh, sometimes after work, if I'd pick her up from childcare and I'd come back to work for a little bit before I went home, I'd put her into the boardroom, the big Commerce boardroom and uh, she would refer to the general as sir and uh, she'd quite happily sit there while I just finished up or did something before I went home and she knows all the ranks and structures, the kids turn up with me every year to Anzac Day. I mean, they may as well be in the military. They understand the structure. In fact, Jess is trying to get into the APS. I think if she got into the APS in defence, she would just fit straight in. She'd have no troubles at all. So just in closing, just given that many of our listeners may be fascinated by having a distinguished career such as yours, but then also combining that with a family and then also remaining committed to wider community engagement as well as I know you are, what would your message be perhaps to young people that might be considering a career in the military? My message would be that if a a country girl like me who grew up on dam sites around New South Wales and family settled in a small town called Manila near Tamworth can become a two-star commanding Australian military forces in the Middle East, 32 years later, you could be anything. So if you uh, work hard, try to be the very best that you can, aim as high as you possibly can and remain humble and authentic, I think that anything is possible. So I'd encourage anyone to join the military. If I was starting my career over again, I'd go to Defence Force Recruiting and I'd sign on that dotted line. If I may, there's just one thing I'd love to follow up on there. You mentioned the importance of being both humble and authentic. Why is it, do you think, that those qualities are so important and how do you embed them in your own way of being? I mean, you have to be honest with yourself. I mean, my command focus or my philosophy over my career as an officer has always been about people first and supporting the people and your family. And it goes the same. I mean, I can't do my job without my family supporting me and nor can any of the other men and women in Joint Task Force 633 do their job without their families or friends supporting them. And you've got to live it and breathe it. I mean, people can tell a mile away when you're not authentic or you're not honest or if you're all about yourself. You've got to believe it. I mean, I'm constantly doing self-help reading. I talk to people. I read autobiographies, biographies of other people that have been successful to try and work out what it is that is that magic formula. But for me, it comes back to that humility and being authentic. It works for me. Well, I hope it works for me. I feel like it works for me. I really enjoy the relationship I have with the men and women that I serve alongside and trying to get to know them and support them to achieve their mission. Major General Susan Coyle, thank you for sharing your experiences and your insights with us. I really appreciate your time with us on Life on the Line today. Thank you for having me, Sharon. It's been, uh, it's been lovely to uh, take the time to reflect down memory lane. I wish you all the very best. Thank you. This is Sharon Maskeldare, and you've been listening to Life on the Line. We are grateful to Major General Susan Coyle for coming on the show. Most of our interviews are with veterans, not personnel currently serving, and so to speak with someone actively on deployment overseas is even more of a treat. Our thanks go to Joint Task Force 633 and Defence Media for the opportunity. And follow adf.middle.east on Instagram for more updates in theatre. This podcast is not our first with JTF 633. A few weeks ago, Sharon also spoke to Captain Alan Bretherton in number 83, Dean and Alan Bretherton. Two of my uncles had lost their eyes, one to infection and one to shrapnel. Everybody got behind each other and spurned each other on. And there will be more conversations between Sharon and JTF 633 personnel to come later this season. We have interviewed a previous commander of JTF 633 on this podcast before. Go back a few weeks and listen to Angus Horden's two-part conversation with retired Major General John Cantwell, AO, DSC who commanded all Australian forces in the Middle East area of operations in 2010. In number 82, John Cantwell, Volume 1. Only to be uh, shot at and cut off and pushed into enemy territory and found myself on the wrong side of the enemy lines, surrounded by Iraqis in the middle of the night with a British tank organisation busily attacking them with me in the middle of it. Meanwhile, American helicopters were trying to shoot me with missiles. And Volume 2. 
there are ways to tackle this damn thing, this PTSD. And uh, it's important that people know that there are others who have been through something like that. And we've interviewed one other major general before. Back in season one, check out Thomas Kay's interview with a veteran of the Australian Army training team Vietnam in number 15, Adrian Clooney's Ross. One of the uh, sappers triggered a booby trap and that killed eight and wounded about 13 uh, in one hit. There was only one NCO left standing and he... He prodded out an area for the uh, helicopter evacuation to come in. And when the uh, first helicopter was coming in, he put his foot outside the cleared area and triggered another mine, killed himself and, and another three. Subscribe to Life on the Line to never miss an episode. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Life on the Line Podcast and on Twitter at L-O-T-L Pod. And our website is www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design. Music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening, and lest we forget.